Hello and welcome. And as I've alluded to in my previous panel, this is basically sort of my summary of the past four years of schema migrations, what's happened, what I've learned, and sort of the future of what's going to happen to Django as we get on. So first of all, who am I? I'm Andrew Godwin. I'm a Django core developer. I'm kind of most well known for writing South, the migrations framework that I'm sure a lot of you use. And I currently work at Lanyard, which is the sort of social commerce directory, just doing sort of back-end work there. So this talk is going to be in three major parts. First of all, I'll cover the past and sort of some of the context and challenges for migrations, sort of look at what came before South, what South has done, how it's evolved, and sort of the reasons why some of the features are in there that are in there. Um, then I'll have a quick look at the current version of South, sort of how it's, what, it, what there is, what the limitations are starting to be, and sort of an overview of the current landscape. And then I'll have a look at the future. So as you may have heard, I have plans for Django itself and for future South and all other sort of exciting things. So that will come there. So first of all, the past. Now, one of the major problems facing all of you is I imagine that databases hate schema changes. Now, a database loves sitting there all by itself, a nice optimized collection of files on disk, all happy. And then you come along and say, no, I want to change these tables and move these columns around. And that's when they get stroppy. Um, Postgres is pretty good these days. MySQL, any alteration will lock a table. SQLite just doesn't even have altering for some things. You can't edit columns in SQLite. It just isn't possible. And so all these kind of problems are there and face anybody trying to change their schema, which happens. You know, web apps, web apps change. Different things happen. You know, different clients come and go or your customer base changes or whatever. Um, and you, know, you can't sit there on a production site with you know, half a million, 10,000 users, whatever, and do a migration that locks the entire site for 15 minutes, hammers the disk, and then if you leave the site running, people see broken pages or weird results or any of that kind of thing. And the other problem is, while version control systems like Git and Mercurial and Subversion do very well at managing our code changes, the same isn't true for schemas. Schemas live separately for your code, live in the database. Git doesn't touch your database. You know, that when you change branches, your database isn't going to change with you. And this is kind of a fundamental problem. And there's no easy way to get around this. Like, South is a help, but this, is always, this always exists. And so one of the challenges here is trying to find a decent solution to making it so that changing your schema is almost as effortless as changing your code. You know, that, that same workflow you're used to exists in both the code and in the schema. Now, some of the problems sort of with these code changes are, are interesting. So you can always add extra fields or add extra columns in this case. Because if you add an extra column to a database, then your application, or Django in particular, doesn't care if there's another column. It selects columns by name. So you can add as many columns as you like, and your old code base will just be fine. And so if you're adding new columns to a website, the best thing to do is run the migrations first and then change the code later, which means you have this sort of nice way of managing those so that they can happen separately, there's no downtime. Um, similarly, the other way around, if you remove a column, your code will complain immediately because it's trying to select that column and will just throw an error. So if you're trying to remove columns, it's best to change your, database, your code first and then remove your database. So it's kind of like this sort of weird two-step process. Um, and the other problem is generally like any kind of field alterations or other changes are just painful and slow, you know. Altering a table with a few million rows may take half an hour on some machines. So before South existed, back in sort of the beginning of time, as it were, um, or 2008, if you want to be particular, um, there were a few different solutions to schema changing. Uh, the, perhaps the major one was Django Evolution, um, written by our own Russ Keith McGee. Um, and there's also one called Demigrations, which was written partially by um, Simon Willison, somebody I now work with and a few other people at Global and a few other places. And these were sort of quite similar. So Django Evolution was interesting that it didn't have persisted to disk migrations by default. It just did changes on your database. And then what you did on your machine might be different to somebody else's machine. And so you had this sort of thing where you could get a little bit out of sync um, sometimes. Demigrations was MySQL only, which is, of course, terrible. So, you know, that's not going to help it. Um, South version 0.1 came along sort of late 2008, just before the first Django Kong US. Um, I released it. I was working at a company called Torchbox at the time. Internally, we went, we want a way to change schema, and we want it to be a bit different to all this other stuff. You know, we took some inspiration from 
the then very young Rails migration modules from some Java things, um, things like Hibernate and some various other places and you know, combine the ideas and went, this is kind of our ideal for how migration should work. So South Point 1 was released. Um, this is the blog post from when I released it, 7th of August 2008. And as you can see, I introduced it as Django evolution not working or too magic. Um, then I have just the solution. And so this is kind of the start of it. Um, and as you can see, this is a sort of a short snippet of the, the database initial module at the time. It, it was a very short, small code base. I think the initial commit is around five or 600 lines of code, and it, it adds columns and doesn't do much else. But then as time goes on, South version point two adds MySQL support, so point one was Postgres only. Um, South version point three adds the first new interesting feature that you never think of, which is dependencies. Because of the way Django apps split up into different code bases and different apps, if you are doing per app migrations, say I add a book model which, which has an author field in it for a foreign key, then my author models have to appear first, otherwise you can't link them together. And so dependencies came in as this way of managing that kind of relationship. So if, if, as long as you've got a non-circular ring of dependencies, you sort of arrange your migration so they all go up in order, so all the foreign keys point to things that already exist. South point four was it started getting interesting. So up until this point, South has only added and deleted columns, which is, you know, 90% of all the grunt work you do as a schema change. Um, but point four introduced the idea of changing columns. So for example, making a varchar longer. If you said, okay, names will never be longer than 50 characters and declared it as varchar 50, then you could come along later and make it varchar 200 or text or something. Um, and also this was the first appearance of the SQL light backend. Um, so for those who aren't familiar with SQLite's internals, which you probably shouldn't be, it has no way of changing tables. All you can do is add columns. It's the only operation it supports. If you want to delete a column, rename a column, alter a column, or any other kind of thing, you have to make a new table with a new schema, copy the, copy the data from the old table to the new table, delete the old table, and then rename the, old, the new one to the old one. Um, and this is what South's backend for SQLite does then and still does today. It's a horrific hack, but it works well enough for development. South version 0.5 introduced the fun feature of OM freezing, which is probably the most talked about thing I always get. So if, ever, if any of you have ever looked at a migration file in South, at the bottom of the file is a very large dictionary full of text strings, which is basically all of your models serialized in a big dictionary. Now this is for RM freezing. The idea is that the models as you see them when you make migration are stored and frozen. So when you run, run the migration again, we can get the old models out again. This means if you change your models in the future, the migrations will always see the current state when they were made. So there's no kind of future incompatibility. Um, RM freezing, by the way, was taken from a very young migration framework at the time called Migratory. Um, its, main, its main claim to fame was it has RM freezing. I kind of added it in and stole their thunder about two weeks later, but it, it worked very well for South at that point. And the other interesting thing that people think is a sort of a core feature of South, but it isn't, is automatic change detection. So until this point, when you made a migration, you said manage.py, start migration, dash dash add field, book.author. There was no detection of what had changed. And so it was all manual, and then this added the thing where you just go, migrate dash dash auto, and South just went, ah oh, yes, and it compared the frozen models with the ones it saw, did a sort of reasonably intelligent diff, and then worked out the changes. And these days, most people run South in auto automatic mode. In fact, a lot of people don't know there's a non-automatic mode that still exists, and there is. You can still do dash dash add field if you want to. South point six um, added field introspection. So until this point, South had, in order to get that frozen model definition you just saw, it opened up your models.py file with a parser module, parsed the file, used some regexes to strip out the field definitions, and then split those down some more into little bits of string code that we stored in the file, which is, of course, horrific. Um, and so we moved to having field introspection, which is basically, rather than parsing this model's file, it looks at the model objects and tries to get out the data from them. Now, the problem here is that when you make a field, the arguments you pass into the field are kind of lost. So some of them, like unique, stay as an attribute. So if I pass unique equals true, then it comes out as dot unique equals true on the, on the field. But some of them don't go like that. Some of them, like, if you pass the two in a foreign key, it disappears down to meta rel two, you know. And some, feel, some options completely disappear in custom fields. They just get split away or thrown away or discarded. And so 
this wasn't without its problems. In particular, custom fields or new fields just wouldn't work with South until you wrote rules for them. And one of the most common questions to this day on the mailing list is, I have a custom field, it's not working with South, how do I do this? And the answer is a horrific string of about two lines of code with these weird regular expressions and rules in them to try and extract that information out. The other improvement was dependency solving speed. Up until now, the dependency solver had been very stupid, but by this point, we're about a year and a half into South, people had very large sets of migrations. They're taking like, several minutes to resolve dependencies. And so somebody actually knew about graph theory, came along, gave me a better, better sort of dependency solver, and that solved a lot of things. So that was really useful. And then the current version of South, um, 0.7, which introduced a split between data and schema migrations, which is for a very obscure reason called um, dry run. So on MySQL, when you have a migration, we, you do what's called dry run it first, which means we run the migration, but we mock the entire database behind it. This is to check for syntax errors, because if you run the migration, it has a syntax error. On MySQL, you can't roll back. There's no transaction support. So it's kind of a, a life-saving feature for that. Um, we also covered, in the case where you're adding a not null column, um, South has that infamous prompt where it goes, you're adding a not null column, you need a default for this, which is entirely true, and otherwise it would error in your database. So this kind of more sort of user-friendly helpful features. There was some multi-DB support there for different database backends. It's still pretty terrible that there wasn't at least some you could adapt. And also, custom fields kind of got a few improvements. In, in particular, we had ways of ignoring custom fields and changes to the rules and that kind of thing. And then that brings us to the present. South is currently version 0.7.6. It's going to hit 1.0 at some point, but I'll cover that later. Um, but it hasn't changed much for two years. It's mostly stable. It's kind of works. I mean, people say it's the thing they love to hate. South is good, it does its job, but it has a lot of idiosyncrasies. And so while Sable API is technically good, it means there's a lot of problems. In particular, there's no way to take this massive set of migrations. Like, you know, at Lanyard, we have, I think it's 452 migrations I counted earlier. Um, that's a lot of migrations, and we can't run them from the beginning. So South currently lacks a way to take a big set of migrations, collapse them down, and start again. Now, you can do this manually, and there's some steps for this on the mailing list and then in documentation, but it's a four or five step process, it's quite involved, it requires doing all the servers at once, and you can screw it up and have a few problems. And so this is kind of arguably now, South is four years old, one of the biggest problems. You know, we have these very mature code bases with hundreds or even thousands of migrations in them. And so this is becoming a real pain point for some people. The other problem is opaque migrations. Because migrations in South are just Python files, in particular, they are a class with a forwards and a backwards method. If I want to migrate forwards, I open the class and just run forwards method, and I pass in database. If I want to run backwards, I run the backwards method. But this means that as a migration framework, I can't take the migrations and see what they do. All I know is there's this opaque object which runs code. And so it's very hard to take a migration and say, oh yes, this adds these models, or this removes these models. And so this means that we can't optimize migrations, we can't collapse them properly, like I just said. You know, there's a lot of things you can't do there. So then we get to the very interesting part, which is the future. And there's a three-step plan that I'm proposing and also mostly implementing some of this to sort of solve all these problems. So the first one is Django DB backend schema. Now, this is a port of South's abstraction layer. That is the bit where I say I want to create a table, and then there's a bit of code that goes, you're using MySQL, this means you want this SQL snippet. Um, so it's analogous to the ORM backends in Django. And the idea here is that that's the very tricky code. That's where the SQLite drop rename table stuff lives. That's where the horrific Oracle namespacing stuff lives. That's where all the sort of special casing for MySQL lives. And so the idea is to move this into part of the backends of Django, um, so Django already has a bit of code for this in dot creation for making tables with SyncDB. Um, this is sort of a, a phase replacement of that. So creation still exists for a while. But this will eventually, hopefully, come through and replace that. And this is currently going quite well. So as I said, it's a database abstraction layer. It has no idea migrations exist. It's not South. It is purely a way of asking the database to create, create models, delete models, alter fields, and that kind of thing. This is sort of the example usage. So you get a connection to so your database or another one if it's not the default one. You do, you get a schema editor, you say dot start, you give it some actions, in this case creating two models, and then you say dot commit. That dot commit, it sits there, looks at what you've asked it to do, 
makes some SQL and runs it to the database. You can do things like alter fields. So you can say, start alter field on book from char field to a text field, then delete the other field, then commit. And then similarly, at that point, it will go through there, look at what you've asked it to do, work out the right SQL, and then commit it. The reason for the sort of start commit process is so that when you add lots of models that depend on each other, then it can sort of resolve foreign keys and do them all at once. Um, otherwise, if you had a sort of circular ring of foreign keys, it would be impossible to do. Now, this is a branch of Django. It does actually exist. I've been working on it for the past couple of months, and it is on my GitHub um, at this address. This is the branch, but obviously I just have a branch of Django. And while it's not complete, it only works on Postgres and MySQL, um, it is coming along quite nicely. So the work still left to do is to make it run on SQLite, to make it run on Oracle, um, to make sure it works kind of all right with things like Microsoft SQL Server, and to make sure the Giz fields work all right. So that's django.contrib.giz. Um, but it is coming along quite well. And if you have some time, I'd love you to go in there. So if, if your database is inclined, like this is not human usable code right now. You can't run, you can run it and Django runs the test pass, but you can't really do much with it. If you have an interest in database alteration or some views or you might want to use this API, then have a look in there. So look at some of the tests. There's a fully tested test suite with extensive examples of how it's used and see how it works. The second part of that plan is something called contrib.migrations. Now, this kind of is south, but it's not south as you know it. So I was talking, so this came around, I was talking to Jacob at DjangoCon Europe this year, um, and he basically expressed his eye at that point that, as I kind of have agreed for the past year or so, that basically south is now the de facto solution and we need something in Django. You know, people have seen, we saw in one of the talks yesterday, like when you get to that tutorial, it's not there. There's no sort of link to it. And you want to change your models, and there's nothing. So the idea here is to have an optional, that's why it's in sort of post being contrib, an optional solution, which is a very sensible, well thought through framework that has learned the lessons of those past four years of South. In particular, there are a few important lessons. So it would completely replace South for creation and running of migrations. So South will basically cease to exist in this sense, but it would exist, you'll see later. Um, but in particular, it would be declarative migrations. So currently South, as I said, has these procedural ones where you just have functions with code. And the idea here is to have migrations that say, I want to alter this field and then delete this field and then rename this table as a sort of declarative list of Python classes. And this means that South, or contribute migration in this case, can go in there, look at what you're doing, optimize it, collapse them down, and do all the clever kind of things. So in particular, this means if you want some kind of collapsing mechanism, it can read all the migrations, work out which ones cancel each other out, and then collapse them into one file again and just give you that file. So it's a very nice, lossless way of doing this kind of thing. It also means, very conveniently, that there's no need for this frozen RM anymore, because if you just look at what you've done in the migrations history, you can see what the models should look like. You know, I can read, I add, created a model, then I added a field, then I removed a field, then I changed a field. And it has the ability to go through those, collapse those down into a model state. And so the idea is it takes, the, it takes these migrations, reads through them, and they can just give you, at any point in your history, a model with that state of what it was supposed to be, even between actions. As I've just said, you know, there is literally no need for this horrific massive dick to the bottom anymore. Migrations would be nice and short, as they used to be. There is, of course, raw SQL support. Um, this is very important. So South does have this currently. You can just pass in SQL strings. But people have expressed this need for, you know, I don't like Django touching my migrations. I just want literally a text file I supply to, to, supply to the migration library just does it. And so the idea here is that you can, if you want, just fall back to a big, massive string of SQL written by your, you know, your super intelligent database administrator, stick that into migrations, it will run it. You know, it's, it's kind of agnostic as to how it works. More importantly, it has the ability to output SQL. So a lot of the complaints I get currently are, you know, well, I've got South, and I've wanted a migration, but I'm in this big corporate, and we have database people, and they live over there. And when I want to make changes, I have to give them some SQL. And South doesn't do that. South does not have a way to output SQL, because it doesn't know what you want to do before it runs it. You know, the only way to do it is to run that actual migration against a copy of the database, and then have logging of the, what it's running turned on, and then copy and paste those. And so because, again, of this symbolic declarative way of doing things, 
We can go through there, we can work out what the SQL is, and then we can output that sensibly to a file. Now, some of the operations are harder to do. So for example, deleting indexes, you can't determine the SQL that run, um, before runtime because index names vary. So if I have, want to delete an index on two columns, inside South or inside migrations even, I have to go to the database, query the right internal tables as to work out what indexes there are, look at those indexes, work out which ones are on the columns I'm on, work out the name of that index, work out the table it's on, and then run the thing to remove the index by name. There's no way of removing indexes by column name or by just anything simpler. And so for those kind of things, I'm not sure yet. It may either output just a sort of a filler thing saying this cannot be translated, or it may try and do some kind of per backend assignment to variables or inner queries, something horrific like that. So that's kind of a, an ongoing thing. This is an example of how my proposed ones will look. Um, so it's kind of quite similar to South. You have a class migration, but in this case you just have actions. So as you can see here, there is, this is a create model action. You pass it a name of the model and the fields of the model, and it just runs. Um, in particular, the interesting thing here is that this field is not instantiated yet. This is because fields have to be addressed by sort of absolute path. You know, migrations have to live in this sort of outside of time state. If I have a migration from six months ago, it should still run on my code base today. You know, there's no reason it should fail horrifically. And so some of indirection is necessary to try and make sure that when you have this migration, that there's no direct imports or anything there that will, that will make it break. And so it has this sort of this slight um, annoying thing where you could have field, class name, and then args and key do, key, key, keyword arguments. Um, but I'm, I'm working on this, making it a bit better, and it's, it's, it's looking better and better. So this also already exists in the partial format. Um, and now this code does not run except the, it only runs on the Django version on my previous set of slides, i.e. the one with schema support built in. And the idea is to get that schema support into version 1.5 of Django, um, which then means that this kind of code can be built on and run as a third party application for testing and evaluation and community release and testing. Um, and so there's a version of Django out there that supports it. This can be run separately, and then if Tom is right and everybody agrees, it can be merged into Contrib as a fully fledged app. Or even if we're going to go with a separate Django thing, keep it separate but sort of officially indoctrinate it. But yeah, so you know, again, this code won't run apart from that other branch, but there's also examples in there of migrations of the tests. And again, if you're so inclined, I'd love you to go in there, have a look at how it works, see what you think of the way it works, and you know, just give me some feedback. Now, the other question I always get asked is, when is South 1.0 coming out? Now, South 0.7 was released in 2010, and I'm terrible at doing releases, it turns out. Um, I once went 13 months without doing a release of South, uh, which I do apologize for, I'm very sorry. But there is now finally a plan for South 1.0. So the key thing is, South 1.0 will have Python 3 support, because it's one of the many blockers about using Python 3 with Django, is that, fine, I, you know, Django's Python 3, I can port my project to it, but you know, I can't run anything sensible. And so me and Amerik, um, in particular, sat down at the conference, we had to have a plan to make sure that we can have Python 3 support in South, that it works sensibly, and that there's something to start using that testing on in Django 1.5. This does, however, mean that it's gonna have to require Python 2.6. Now, South, at the moment, works with Django 1.2 and up, and Python 2.4 and up. But to make sure Python 3 support works sensibly, it has to be 2.6 to have all the, you know, there's a lot of helper variables in 2.6 that are the same as Python 3. And so this means that we're gonna have to have two separate versions of South side by side. And so there'll be the 0.7 series if you're on 1.3 or 1.2, or if you're on Python 2.5, and then you can move up to 1.0 if you're on the 1.5 series or Python 2.6. And so this will be annoying for a while, but the idea is to have this sort of this bridge gap between the current situation of South and then the future of what is hopefully contrib.migrations. And of course, this is all subject to change. You know, I've written some of this code. A lot of it works surprisingly well, like it makes tables and everything. I was quite surprised. But it is all subject to change. So I would love your feedback. I would love some, like, you know, your feelings about this, some case studies. Um, in particular, you know, there are, there are, I have learned over the past four years 
There are people with crazy databases out there. You should see some of the debug reports I've had. It's mad. You know, there are people who make, role, make models at runtime inside views. There are people who sort of change database aliases on the fly, all this kind of stuff. And so I'd love if you have any kind of interest in this or weird use cases or just want to sort of help out with this. You know, come and find me during the sprints. You know, I'll be here both sprint days working on this code, you know, migrations and the, the schema branch of Django. And just come, you know, share some ideas, talk to me about this kind of stuff, and I, I, I'd love to get a feeling of what you think of this kind of thing. And with that, I'm finished, and any questions? Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Andrew. Um, got a question about the declarative syntax and how that applies to things like data migrations or data change migrations. You know, I want, yeah. a, I want a prefix kitten on the front of every text field. What, what does that look like from the point of view of a, I mean, I'm familiar with what it looks like in South. What does it look like in yeah. a, in a declarative So sense? there's two situations there. So there will be some pre-made actions, things like I want to move database, data from one column to another or whatever. So those will be done as declarative objects. And it'll also be a Python action, which just takes Python code and you can do whatever you like. So the problem is you can't collapse that very easily, but you can still collapse it inside other code. And that looks like a string that contains a block. That will look like South currently does. That, ba that basically means I want to fall back to what South does now, which is a string of Python RM operations, basically. Okay, so, but I mean, a string in the sense of it is inside quotes a string. Yes. Or, okay. Right. Um, there's a possibility to have a different class of migration that would just run forwards and backwards methods the same way it used to, but I'm not sure yet about that. Like that, that's that's kind of still in flux. But you're right. There needs to be support for that, obviously. Uh, also about declarative migrations. Uh, wondering how that squares with um, arbitrary SQL migrations. Like, I feel like either you, are you going to lose everything if you do arbitrary SQL migrations, or are you doing something insane like parsing SQL? I really yeah. hope not. So I'm not that insane. Uh, so the idea is if you do have raw SQL migrations, either you'll lose the ability to have the models built for you, which is if they're all raw SQL, that's going to make sense, um, or you'll be able to supply, you know, like this is effectively this change. You know, like, if I write a raw SQL file, or it might actually be strings inside that kind of declarative syntax, you'll be able to say, and at the same time, this would have added this column or whatever, or it, it makes this change to the model. Um, so there is kind of a way out there. Like, obviously, writing raw SQL is more work anyway, so I don't feel too bad about adding more work to that. And like, if you really want these, and you also want the auto detection, then you're gonna have to do a little work for that. And that, I think that makes sense. Um, I wanted to know if there's any a thought or whether there's even a need for, for lack of a better word, a migration path off of South and onto this new API? Um, and, uh, and I have another question, but I can get in the back of the line. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah, so the migration path is an interesting one. So this kind of ties in with the problem of too many migrations currently. So several companies, in fact, a lot of people I know, are basically what's called like they're throwing away their history of migrations. So it's possible to do this. So you can take your migrations, you can wipe the table, make new initial migrations, then set it all back to that. And so the migration path will be similar for this. The idea is that you'll basically declare bankruptcy on your old ones and move, rather than moving to new initial migrations, you'll move over to the new set. Um, there'll be some helper code for this kind of thing. Obviously, you know, south and, you know, I write both things so that I can know how they work. But yeah, like, it's not too hard to migrate. You know, it's not running, it's, it's an offline process. You know, South has no security holds because it's offline almost. Like, it's, it's a nice kind of situation to be in from, as a library author. You can do things a lot worse that you get, like, wouldn't get away with in the web browser. Yeah, uh, in regards to what you just said about bankruptcy, right? We declared sort of South bankruptcy also, right? You had to delete the South migration history table. Is yeah. that table gonna still be a thing? Going yeah, the on? table will still be a thing. So the key thing about the table of history is that it, is a, it is the only sort of sane way to work out what migrations are, apply in the database. Like you could try and sniff it in introspective, but that's madness. Right. And so, so that, <laughs> that will stay. It'll probably be renamed to migration history rather than south migration history, but it is, it is gonna stay. It might get a bit more cleaned up in terms of how it refers to migrations as right, well. Right, so, so the issue we had with that table is that you, know, you declare bankruptcy in one machine maybe in development, and then you load backups from yeah. somewhere else, and the, the old table is there. Right. Exactly. So are you going to do anything about that, or is it still just up to us to delete? Yes. No, that, so there is a very clever solution to this, as I'm very pleased I came up with. Um, but no, the idea is that when you declare bankruptcy, rather than resetting to migration number one, you reset to a number that is ahead of all the other ones. But it has a thing to declare it, so that if you do load that set in south or migrations, you can detect sort of the first new starting off point, and it will ignore everything else in history. Uh -huh. 
So it, there's a sort of a sensible way of, it's kind of like Oka Branch history, it knows where to come in from the side again. And, okay, and so resetting to number one was a bad idea. I should have reset to number. Well, no, it's, it's fine now. Like, yeah, it, it, But yeah, in the future, it will. That's you know, it, that in the future it will work that way. There's a way where it can know that you've done it offline, and that way it will sync correctly. You know, if I git push a new initial migration, everything else won't just fail. It will correctly work it out. Like if it's a current, if it's a current installation, it will skip that one. If it's a new installation, it will skip everything else. Like they just kind of merge in, and then there's a new history there. All right, cool. Thanks. For these schema migrations. Uh, you said there was a little bit of trickery you had to do for MySQL because it has custom behaviors. Are you doing that in such a way that it's truly core logic that's not really using some external interface meant for third-party databases like Django MS SQL? So yeah, so the way the module is written is that there is a generic schema module in backends.schema that has nearly all of the code in it, and it does sort of feature flag detection and that kind of stuff. And so the I think the MySQL override module is currently 12 lines of just a few different SQL statements. And similarly, the Oracle one will be a few more lines and a few overridden methods. It's all sort of very class-based. Like, you, t you, you inherit from the base operations object, you override the correct set of methods and strings of SQL, and then that's fine. And so the idea is that, yeah, there is, there is shared logic there. Like, you know, there is a very good base set that happens to be Postgres, but uh, um, the base set of sort of logic is there, and it's all very extensible, and it goes off, um, something in the backend called uh, database features. So you can say like, my database backend does not support nulls with strings or something, and then it will do the correct thing based on that. Okay, thanks. So as you stated, self is the default for everything but one thing, which is permissions. Yes. And so uh, what's the plan with this feature as far as supporting permissions and that kind of thing? So the problem with South and permissions is that South is table-based, not model-based. So if you look at the South migration, it is create table, delete table, add column, remove column. Uh, migrations is create model, delete model, add field, remove field. And that means that, you know, now I'm working in terms of models, we can work in terms of permissions again. So the problem in South is that it has no concept of models. You know, it works on a purely SQL layer, so it doesn't know when to add permissions in. Whereas in this kind of thing, you can have the thing saying, hey, I've made this model, I can fire the right signal now to make the permissions in the back end. So that will be solved. I mean, there's still the problem of, do I fire the signal as soon as I make the model, but it's an old version, when I finish making the model, all the changes, in like the current version of the model. So that's kind of a tricky situation, but I'm pretty sure there's some, a lot of sort of previous examples of that. The, the, the ticket for this on the South track is long and full of discussions, so there's some good stuff there to work off of. Hi, it's me again. Hello. <laughs> um, uh, I don't, really know of a good solution of, of this in South, so feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, but um, I've always found that testing migrations is a little precarious. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you can have the test suite uh, run your migrations to build the thing, but you can't effectively, I think, test data migrations in a good way. Is that something that is planned as part of this API or something that you're thinking about? Yeah. Well, so. This kind of helps, so the, the, the declarative thing helps again here, that you, like, you can literally say to the back end, take my migrations, run them in the in-memory thing that just builds model state, and see what comes out at the end. So like, you can sit there and assert that your migrations make the right models. And that's, in fact, how a new test suite works. It sits there, runs them all together, looks at the model state, and goes, oh, yeah, this is the same author I expected I got here. So that helps. But data migrations is a bit harder. Um, I don't think there's an easy way around those, apart from having an actual database and, doing, and running the migrations. But it is now structured in a way where you can take a migration object, like these turn into classes, you can take those and just run them, like individually. And you can pass, and there's a whole planner, and it's all separate out, like the planner is separate to the runner, is separate to the thing that passes them from files. And so if you want to, you can extract different bits of it and just run a migration, or if you want to use it like at runtime, you can make tables at runtime. You can just call Schema Editor and try that. So it's kind of, I'm trying to make it more sort of bitty and easier to sort of take bits out of it and reuse them elsewhere. And also, I kind of, I kind of hope that, that somebody else has different migration library ideas, right? Like that's why the schema backend is separate from migrations. Like I want to leave the door open for somebody with better ideas or a different approach to come in and help. So, thank you. Hi. Hi. Uh, I was wondering now that we are moving south to have better support for models. Um, one thing that's always been kind of a sticking point in my use of south has been 
renaming things. So if yes. I create or delete a model, it's great. But if I change the name of the model, there's no easy way to m just move all of the data over. I have to go in and explicitly rename the table or the field or whatever. Yep. So you'll be pleased to know that there is built-in renaming actions already in these example code bases. Um, there's no auto detection support. So auto, auto detection is the hard thing, right? If you rename a model, it looks like, well, there's a brand new model here and this other one went away. But the idea is you do some kind of heuristic detection like, well, the new model has all the same fields and it has all the same options as the old model, so it's probably a rename. And so, yeah, so the idea is to take that kind of heuristic detection of renaming of models and fields and apply that. Um, but yeah, like, that is a problem currently with Cell. And there is, um, somebody does have a branch that currently supports this, but it's, in, for proper South, it's not fully tested yet. And so, like, it's kind of there and kind of not, but the ideas are there and certainly well, that's gonna go in. I've noticed that uh, a lot of code bases um, create implicit uh, migration dependencies without specifying it depends on explicitly. Yeah. Uh, often this comes up when you want to freeze another app uh, in a migration and you forget to include the depends on. Uh, is there any reason why uh, you couldn't just uh, say any frozen app in your migration should also be a dependency? Uh, no, I mean, that, that, and that is also kind of different now. I mean, so the problem there is that South didn't properly detect foreign key in many, 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 many relationships. Um, whereas, so with this kind of thing, because you have to have them there and you need to build your, your state, um, it's going to have to have that better dependency management, right? That's going to have to be in there. But yeah, you're right. Like, so the problem is there is an open ticket for this in South and making it better and adding the freeze stuff and just adding better detection because you, you shouldn't have to use freeze, right? You should just know that you want everything. Um, but yeah, the idea is that if you want those things, they will be automatically detected, you can add them in explicitly, and then if you don't have any dependency on anything, it will just bring in the latest version of that code base if you want it anyway. So it will work in nearly all of the cases. Great, um, that sounds much better. Yeah, exactly. Thank you very much.